Hi, we'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for departments of transportation. Uh, I'm Terry Bills. I'm the Transportation Industry Manager here at Esri, and today I'm joined by Omar Maher, who leads our artificial intelligence uh, team, and together with Daniel Wilson and David Yu, both on the uh, artificial intelligence uh, team. Uh, Today's webinar is focused on how departments of transportation and other transportation-related uh, agencies can utilize ArcGIS together with machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence to gain, to gain greater insight and knowledge from their digital data. Uh, as you'll see, we're just beginning to scratch the surface and to understand the uh, numerous ways in which we can apply these new technologies to address uh, critical transportation issues. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to point out that we are recording this webinar, and while everyone will be on mute, uh, there will be time for question and answers uh, at the end of the presentation. You can type your uh, questions into the question box, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Additionally, the slides uh, which you see, which are part of this webinar, uh, will be made available uh, on the GeoNet uh, group, uh, Departments of Transportation, uh, as well as the webinar itself will be available on the uh, uh, transportation webpage uh, soon. All right, so to start off, a few years ago, uh, two researchers at MIT uh, forecast the future of these emerging technologies, calling it the second machine age. Um, they basically said that through the use of machine learning and uh, the ability to develop sophisticated algorithms, uh, the modern age would allow us to build systems that would be better able to manage our modern systems uh, than what we humans will be able to do on our own. Um, and so today what we want to do is really go through a number of examples uh, of how uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can be used to help us uh, not only ask but, but answer uh, critical questions in transportation. Um, and so uh, for departments of transportation, uh, state DOTs and national roadway administrations, uh, a number of agencies have really already started to uh, learn how to use these technologies, certainly applied to safety analysis, and you'll see a great example of that uh, today. Uh, asset extraction and change detection, certainly uh, not only for traditional asset management, but also looking ahead to the era of autonomous uh, uh, vehicles and, and uh, uh, how we identify uh, change uh, in a connected vehicle world. Uh, Right-of-way management, uh, certainly I think we're beginning to see uh, traffic uh, counts uh, through uh, uh, AI and machine learning and ultimately how does some of this information then feed into our modern traffic management systems. On the rail side, uh, again, certainly asset extraction and change detection, certainly change detection for positive train control here in the US and uh, in Europe for ERT, uh, ERTMS. Uh, Right-of-way management, a number of uh, railroads and railways have already uh, discovered how they can use uh, LIDAR and machine learning uh, to identify areas for uh, vegetation management. Uh, certainly we're now uh, beginning to understand how we can use these technologies for passenger social distancing in railway stations uh, and even on the trains themselves. Uh, track and bridge clearance uh, and ultimately uh, I think the real uh, opportunity here is being able to use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence together with track geometry, large amount of track geometry data to be able to take us into the era of predictive maintenance and better maintenance. Uh, on the aviation side, uh, I think the opportunities for runway safety uh, have probably not been uh, fully tapped yet, and I do see that as a really promising area for being able to identify uh, runway incursions using machine learning and, and other runway uh, safety issues. 
again in the terminal, passenger social distancing, and we are working with a number of airports, uh, looking at how the technology can be applied there. Uh, you will see an, an example of pavement management today and how we use uh, machine learning to uh, look at uh, pavement uh, more effectively and ultimately uh, airport security systems. Um, these are really just some of the early areas where we've learned how to apply machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence for transportation applications. I think we all feel like uh, we are just beginning to understand how we can effectively use these technologies. And so to that extent, let me turn it over to Omar Marhar that's uh, going to uh, uh, give a little bit of an overview and then dive into a number of the examples. So Omar, over to you. Thanks, Terry. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be with you today. And uh, the main reason behind my excitement is I deeply believe GeoAI can bring a lot of value to transportation. Uh, if you think about it, transportation as a sector is a, a very geospatial sector, right? I mean, everything is happening in space, obviously, right? Uh, and that's and that's a space that GeoAI um, can bring a lot of value. Uh, as we're going to explain, um, machine learning in general and AI in general needs context. And by context, we mean uh, data and variables and features. And for most of the problems that we're going to show today, as you're going to see, um, they have a very spatial nature. And bringing in these, uh, this kind of spatial context, spatial variables, spatial data easily uh, to meet with machine learning uh, as, and as an input to machine learning uh, is going to be critical. And for the sake of that, um, we see the value of using a GIS platform like ArcGIS together with machine learning infused together uh, to bring in this kind of value. Uh, so I want to go through the agenda real quick. So we're going to start by um, an intro to the AI uh, machine learning, deep learning world, and uh, the AI capabilities in RGS. Uh, we're going to explore the three main patterns for GUAI in transportation. Uh, we're going to start by a very interesting use case of using uh, machine learning to predict risk for crash per segment. Um, it's a very, use, a very good use case that uh, clearly shows this kind of integration between the GIS world and the machine learning world and the very spatial context of the machine learning problems we're trying to solve. Uh, that's going to be followed by another use case uh, for traffic analytics from video feeds, uh, extracting intelligence out of video feeds using deep learning. Uh, we're going to uh, explore the world of asset extraction and feature extraction from oriented imagery. Uh, that's where uh, David is going to walk us through good examples for road crack detection, sign detection, snow level detection. Um, and we're going to see how we can do this from LiDAR through the asset extraction from LiDAR use case. And we're going to uh, close with sharing useful resources and open Q&A. So as Teddy mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to send them over in the chat box uh, throughout the webinar. We're going to take notes of these questions and answer them at the, at the end. So I want to start with this. Um, you might be hearing a lot of buzzwords recently, right? So AI, deep learning, uh, neural networks, data science. A lot of uh, words are being thrown uh, recently. And there is a reason behind this hype, uh, to be honest. Uh, that's because AI is recently achieving uh, very good performance in, 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 in a lot of problems, as we're going to see. But I wanted to start by laying the foundation of what's AI, what's machine learning, what's deep learning. AI is the big idea of achieving human level intelligence. And this idea has been, uh, I mean, the term uh, was, was coined around the 50s. So the idea itself is not new. Uh, maybe uh, there are some specific uh, technologies and advancements happened recently. Um, and this idea, this big idea has different uh, categories under it, right? Uh, like robotics or perception uh, or knowledge representation. And then machine learning is a subfield of AI that's about learning from data to derive rules and extract patterns instead of being explicitly programmed. And deep learning is one type of machine learning that's using deep neural networks. Uh, and this is becoming very good, especially with high dimensional data like voice, image, or text. We're going to see some examples for these today. And uh, we're seeing three main patterns for AI meeting GEO, right? Um, uh, the first one is about object detection and feature extraction, obviously, right? So anything that human beings can see and detect under one or two seconds from different kinds of imagery or LiDAR or videos, 
we can generally train deep learning models to detect it, right? So counting cars from CCTVs, detecting buildings and road segments and assets from overhead imagery, uh, detecting road signs and traffic lights from LIDAR or oriented imagery. All of these are examples uh, for things that could be automated using AI. And we're gonna see a couple of examples for these today. Now, the main catch here is that for a lot of these use cases, we see the importance of bringing this back to the GIS because it doesn't really stop usually at making these detections, usually some level of analysis or post-processing needs to happen in the GIS. And that's, kind of, that's, that's why we're excited about doing this kind of um, analysis and bringing it to the GIS to do some post-processing and more analysis. The second pattern is about making prediction for geospatial events. So think of predicting road crashes, uh, road crash risk. We're gonna see this as the first use case today, uh, predicting, um, any geospatial events like water pipeline failures, uh, crimes, incidents, fires, congestion, you name it. Uh, the third pattern is really about finding patterns, right? So we're not trying to predict something, we're trying to find patterns in a lot of vector data and uh, we can use different clustering or unsupervised learning techniques for that, like finding the emerging and fading hotspots for crash data or finding the statistically significant clusters for crash data. Uh, so these are the three main patterns. So one thing I want to invite you to is to think about the different use cases in your domain or your organization uh, uh, that fall under any of these patterns. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that AI is not really a product in ArcGIS. It's a capability that spans multiple products. So you can see it today in the ArcGIS API for Python. You can see it in ArcGIS notebooks. You can see it in enterprise, in ArcGIS online. It's in, uh, uh, we're doing a lot of research to bring in this uh, for a lot of other capabilities like RGS analytics for IoT, for example. And that's the way we think about it. You can use the machine learning capabilities today in RGS to either classify overhead imagery into previous and imprevious surface, for example, make predictions. We have a lot of algorithms built in that you can use without coding, like geographically weighted regression or, um, or other algorithms like the ordinary least square or the geographically weighted logistic regression or the forest based prediction and classification. If you have a lot of vector data and you want to find patterns, you can use the clustering techniques like the space time pattern mining or um, the density based clustering. Recently, we have been adding a lot of capabilities for deep learning as well. So you can detect objects and extract features and classify pixels. Uh, mostly out of overhead imagery and recently with other kinds of imagery like oriented imagery using the deep learning capabilities that we have and we have also added some natural language processing capabilities uh, specifically for entity recognition and we have a dedicated webinar for natural language processing or text analytics with RGS that uh, you can go and see actually we are sharing all of these links on our GeoAI group on LinkedIn we're going to share a link for that group at the end uh, so this capability would enable you to extract entities like places, people, products, organizations, and location, uh, obviously, out of unstructured text. And we are trying to not reinvent the wheel, obviously, right? So we know that a lot of uh, advancements are happening outside of RGS in the world of machine learning. And that's why we invest a lot in uh, integrating with deep learning and machine learning frameworks. So we can integrate with most of these using the RGS API for Python. And uh, finally, uh, I want to mention that uh, RGS Notebooks is a, a capability that uh, is available today in server or as RGS Notebook server and in Pro 2.5 as RGS Notebooks in Pro. And it's really about bringing the Jupyter Notebooks, which is um, a great vehicle for doing data science and machine learning and deep learning, to be tightly integrated with the rest of the RGS ecosystem. So it's tightly uh, integrated with or connected to the uh, data stores, to the analytics engine like GU Analytics and Raster Analytics. And it comes pre-configured with 300 plus data science libraries. And it can help you do a lot of these workflows we can, we can, uh, we're gonna see today. Um, and you can think of RGS notebooks uh, as, as, as a product that sits at the intersection of RGS and open data science, right? So it brings the power of the ArcGIS ecosystem and uh, the power of open source Python and data science kind of libraries and packages like Keras and Jupyter and OpenCV and PyTorch, et cetera. So with that said, I want to move on to our first uh, use case and our first uh, demo for using GUI and transportation today, 
for predicting crash risk. And I'm going to pass it over to Daniel. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing uh, to predict car accident risk or car crash risk uh, using machine learning. So rather than focus on the machine learning side of this, I would actually kind of like to focus on how geography is important within this problem um, and how you can use geography to prepare features to build a, a machine learning model. So when we're talking about a problem like car crash uh, prediction, um, there's a lot of different things that we could consider. So some of the more obvious ones, at least to me, um, are using weather. So you know, when you're driving on the road, uh, precipitation, snow, visibility, all of these factors are dynamic conditions that we definitely need to take into account. That comes uh, into play by using uh, high accuracy weather data. Uh, the next one on the list would be you know, physical road properties, looking at things like uh, the curvature of the road or how close that particular point is to an interchange or an intersection. Uh, other attributes like the speed limit or the, the number of lanes or, or other information. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about some of these physical properties, but I just wanna motivate this with, with a, a few things up front. Uh, and then temporal factors. So, uh, you know, different times of the day, more people are out on the roads, uh, you know, such as during rush hour, um, these are these are very important. Uh, position of the sun um, can can act as a, a driver distraction. So if you're driving down the road when the, the sun is rising or setting, uh, that can cause a, a major distraction, and uh, it's something that you'd want to consider when uh, when looking at a model. Um, and then finally, human factors probably the most important. I left it for last because it's also the the most difficult to to uh, to model and monitor. Um, but human factors such as you know, the number of cars that are on the road or the speeds that people are going, uh, driver distractions, the, you know, the thought process of individual drivers. There are you know, dozens or hundreds of factors that we could include in this analysis. And I want to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the factors that we could include within a predictive model. So let's, let's back up for just a second and talk about what a predictive model would look like. Uh, so there are a lot of approaches to solving this problem using different areas of machine learning, supervised machine learning, uh, an interesting field called positive unlabeled machine learning, uh, some regression, some st statistical analysis. There's a lot of different models that we could consider in this case. So I don't want to talk about any one individual model. I want to talk about some of the ingredients that needs to go into any, uh, any model that we're looking at here. So consider this road segment here. So this is just you know, some arbitrary stretch of road. Um, there's some curves and, and some information. Uh, when we're talking about building a machine learning model to predict car accident risk, uh, really what we care about in this case is which point on the road has a higher chance of an accident. We're not trying to predict an individual point along the road that, uh, you know, exactly when and where an accident is going to occur, but I want to be able to rank any point along this road in terms of its risk. So basically, um, you know, if I have a model and I can evaluate this, this location here, is it a higher chance than, uh, than this point or, uh, you know, potentially it's a lower point. Um, so what we do is we, we, we build a whole bunch of features that we would include into a model, and then we would uh, estimate the car accident risk, such as you know, along a different milepost along this road. Uh, basically, what we can do is uh, build a set of features. Um, sorry, PowerPoint froze. Um, anyway, we develop a bunch of features that are going to be included within this, uh, this larger analysis. Um, apologize, my computer's having some technical difficulties, but I will get back to this in a sec. Sorry about that. All right, hopefully we won't have any more technical difficulties for the rest of this. Uh, so what I want to turn over to is feature engineering for car crash prediction. So rather than focusing on the machine learning model, I want to focus on the data the inputs that we would use to create such a model. So in order to build a predictive model, um, we really need to you know, consider all of these factors. So I listed a bunch of them, um, you know, human factors, physical factors, and environmental factors. Um, I wanna talk about some of these, uh, these individually and how we could create some of these using GIS. 
Uh, so first, first off, you know, we can we can think about uh, human factors such as as traffic. Now, one way to look at that is to look at the uh, annual average daily traffic on individual road segments. Um, if that is collected, up to date, and complete, uh, that's a very good data set that we can use as kind of a first pass at the the number of cars that are on the road. Uh, real time data um, could provide even more uh, more real time context to that. Um, but sometimes when that's unavailable, or you know, we want to you know, analyze some other factors besides just the number of cars on the road, uh, we can look at bringing in other information such as demographics data. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is just a map of population density at census block groups. Uh, this could be intersected with road segments to add that as an additional feature um, onto the road network that we would want to make predictions on. Um, but let's say we're looking at a different problem. So instead of just looking at uh, you know the number of people. Maybe we're interested at building interested in building a model that estimates risk to bicycles. Uh, so in that case, we could use a, a layer of you know the number of people that bike to work um, instead of just using the population density. Um, there's of course numerous other factors to consider. We could look at uh, you know risk based on on driver age or or other information. There's there's a there's numerous demographics variables that we might want to consider in this model um, and Esri's uh, uh, de demographics data. Uh, brings that all to you so that you can uh, you can use that within a model. Um, okay, Oops. things are not going to behave for my computer today. Hold on just a second. I refresh this because it is not not working. Apologize for that. Okay, I think we're back to normal now. Okay, so once we've you know enriched the road segments with some of that uh, demographics information, you know we can begin to look at other types of features. Um, and, and in this case, I want to talk about geometric and contextual features. So things that we can compute off of the geometry itself, or uh, how the geometry relates to the larger geography around it. So if we look at this road out of context, uh, you know without any other information behind it. There's a lot of things that we can get from the attribute table, things like speed limit, average traffic counts, number of lanes, et cetera. Uh, the list goes on. You know, maybe when I'm looking at this, if I don't have that information in the attribute table, I might want to consider curvature. So this road obviously has some curves in it, but we don't really have any more information about the, the context of that curve. You know, is that, uh, is that something that the driver can see uh, coming up on it, or is that something that's going to be you know, an out of, out of context uh, curve? Um, so can you tell the difference between that road and this road? Well, I mean, this road has a similar level of curvature. Pretty much everything in the attribute table is the same, the same speed limit, same number of lanes, all that information. Um, but it's really hard to say which one of these roads would be more hazardous until you start to include its geographic context. So in this case, what I did was um, I brought in some 3D information. I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the terrain now. And we can see that you know, there's a couple blind corners. And this is actually a, a road that is known to be fairly dangerous within uh, the, the Rocky Mountains of, of Colorado. Um, so if I compare that road, you know, back to that original road that I look like, you know, I'm going to the other side of the state here, I'm looking at that. Now that we bring in more information, we can see that, uh, you know, this one, you know, potentially might not be as dangerous because uh, for one, there's no, there's nothing blocking the field of view of these roads. Um, there's a lot of information that uh, we just wouldn't be able to model unless we included its larger context. So we're looking at even just terrain, uh, potentially land use, uh, and some inf other information, we might be able to, uh, to, to uh, kind of differentiate these roads a little bit better. So I want to back up for just a second and talk about the curvature itself. So there's a lot of different ways to measure curvature. Um, for some of the accident prediction models that we've built, um, we've used a, a particular type of, of measurement called the, the inverse curve radius. Um, so basically, if I'm looking at this line geometry, if I imagine putting a circle at any point along this road, the radius of that circle would be uh, roughly proportional to the, the curvature of the road. So basically, a smaller uh, curve radius uh, would mean that the, uh, the curve is tighter, and that's something that's really easy to calculate um, using ArcGIS. So that way what I can do is I can take all of my geometry features and I can calculate what the curvature is at any, any point along the road and, uh, and use that for a predictive model. Uh, so let's look at another example real quick. I'm gonna go to one of my favorite locations in Colorado. It's a, uh, the mountain town of Uray. 
Uh, so it's a very curvy road. Um, there's a, you know, it's a small tra town, fairly low traffic, um, but you really miss the greater geographic context without uh, without considering where this what this location is. So I mean, not only is this a beautiful view, um, but now that I bring in terrain and potentially you know land cover or other information, now I can look at uh, you know different calculating different features off of the road. I could look at the hazard that that falling rocks might uh, provide by looking at uh, some of the information about these mountains. Um, I could look at the steep drop-offs to the right. You know, if I had information about guardrails and the and, and drop-offs, I could use that information to create new features. Um, basically, you know, now that I have a, a digital terrain model and all of this, uh, you know, we can use our imagination when we're creating new features. Um, and we also need to consider dynamic conditions. So weather is obviously a major one, but even just looking at the uh, at the time of day. Um, this road takes on completely different behavior when we look at uh, it in the daytime versus nighttime. Technical difficulties again. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so now I'm going to go to a different area. So this is uh, this is downtown Denver, the I-25 corridor. Um, around this area, we see some of the, the largest number of accidents within the state. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I look at a map like this, it's really hard for me to appreciate what that scene looks like in real life. You know, kind of all the road segments and, and the area kind of blends together. I know that there's a, a river going through here. There's the, the Platte River, and I know there's a lot of roads. Um, but unless I bring in some in additional information, sometimes it's hard to appreciate that. And for a machine learning model, the same thing is true. So a machine learning model needs as much information as possible uh, in order to be accurate. So what we can do is we can use 3D content, such as these buildings that are currently loading, um, to model visual abstractions or challenging driving situations. Um, and so now using, uh, using machine learning, what we can do is we can uh, take these, these, this 3D content, we can take terrain, we can take the properties of the road, and we can all bring that together in order to uh, to do this sort of modeling. That also allows me to do things like, instead of just looking at the time of day, now I can look at that in context uh, of, the, of the geography. And in this case, um, there might be situations where I'm driving down the road here and I go around a corner and then all of a sudden the sun's in my eyes because the sun is setting. Now this is information that I could just apply the time of day as a feature in the model, um, but when I include the position of the sun and look at areas that are shadowed or anything like that, um, that gives me a lot more uh, predictive power in my model because now I'm not just looking at the time of day, I'm looking at how the time of day interacts with all of the other geographic and geometric content within the scene. Okay, so now I'm going to go into um, a little bit, you know, kind of zoom in on some of these buildings and look at another aspect of, of driving hazards that 3D content can add. So in a, you know, a lot of areas, you know, if I were just looking at the, the grid of, of roads and I didn't consider the buildings around them, it could look similar to a much lower populated area. But now uh, we have these, these large buildings, which could be visual obstructions. Um, and there's other information here that we want, would want to bring into it. Um, so what we can do is we can model the visibility along the road using some of the 3D analyst tools. So ArcGIS allows us to use visual obstructions such as buildings or terrain to estimate which points are blocked to the driver. So we could use a similar analysis to what we could do with the with the uh, the uh, the curves within the mountains, and we could use the buildings instead as our content. So let's imagine I'm at this place and I want to see, you know, if I'm driving along this road, what what can I what can the driver actually see? So what I can do is I can calculate new features off of this. So using you know, the line of sight tools, what I can do is I can, I can calculate sight lines around this point and I can see how far I can see in every direction. So this gives me, you know, at this point, I could calculate you know, what, what's the average distance that I can see you know, around a circle. Or I could look at you know, the density of some of these visual obstructions, are there areas that you know, maybe I'm, I'm coming up to this intersection then all of a sudden I can see in these directions. But coming up to it, I have no visibility of that. I would have no way of avoiding a, a speeding vehicle. Uh, so this kind of gives us a way of quantifying risk, you know, due to just different things around like, like buildings. And this gives, you know, a new perspective to a machine learning model that it might not have had before without calculating this information. So now looking at uh, 3D content and 
uh, the attributes of the roads and potentially many other features, uh, you know, that gives me a lot of power. So this is, of course, not everything that I could consider. I want to jump back to the PowerPoint just for one last slide here to kind of motivate what I'm talking about a little bit further. So we've talked about 3D buildings and I think 3D content is often neglected, especially within a machine learning context. Sometimes it's just difficult to work with and ArcGIS makes that a lot simpler. Um, another thing that uh, you'll, you'll notice that I never talked about, but is of considerable importance, is looking at the actual network properties. So looking at the actual network data set, you know, if I'm coming up to a, a highway on-ramp or an intersection, the connectivity of the roads, the, uh, you know, the changes of, in speed limit, some of the properties that are not just native to a single point on the road are something that I would want to bring into this. Uh, terrain, that gives me, you know, slope, elevation, and uh, visual obstructions. Uh, demographics, as we discussed, uh, gives me information about population density or the number of bikes or, you know, there's a lot of other factors that I could bring in from that. Um, because we're looking at machine learning, some of the recent deep learning innovations have allowed me to take into account things like imagery. Uh, we can bring in weather data. And then finally, um, geometry, looking at the roads themselves. Uh, so I hope that kind of motivates some of the geographic features that we would want to include in a, a model such as this. And I'm going to turn it back to Omar. Thanks, Daniel. I mean, isn't this amazing? Seriously? I mean, this is the very story that we were discussing at the beginning, which is the idea of the very spatial context of these kind of machine learning problems we're trying to solve, right? Or the problems we're trying to solve with machine learning. As Daniel mentioned, um, actually there, there's, a, there's a nice saying that I, I always reference at these uh, situations. So uh, Stephen Hawking is one of the most respected uh, theoretical physicists. He once said, uh, the worst enemy to, um, the worst enemy is not ignorance, it's more of the illusion of knowledge. And that's one of the most uh, uh, tough challenges for machine learning in general, is to smartly select the needed input features or the needed input variables, which uh, the process that Daniel just explained. The idea of using ArcGIS uh, to bring in these kind of spatial variables uh, to be able to model the problem and be able to build a predictive model is way more important, in my opinion, than building the model itself. Because as Daniel mentioned, there are a lot of techniques of building uh, uh, models, but to carefully select the variables and to model the context first uh, before doing the modeling is is, is very important here. Um, so you can think about leveraging different pieces in ArcGIS for that. Uh, you can leverage the living atlas and the demographics data and the street map premium for the data piece and to bring in these different layers of data. You can then leverage the ArcPy and the ArcGIS API for Python to do the spatial feature engineering and calculate the proximity and the curvature and a lot of other things. You can then interface with machine learning engines like scikit-learn or others to build the models, whether it's a deep learning or a machine learning model. Once you have a working model, you can consume it in ArcGIS, again, using the ArcGIS API for Python and visualize the results and build information products using dashboards and apps and maps. Uh, and that's why we see great value of using ArcGIS for these kinds of machine learning problems. So with that said, I want to shift gears to the other use case, which is uh, CCTV activity detection from cameras. So videos are uh, a great source of information. The main challenge, though, is how do we extract uh, information out of videos? Videos are considered to be one of the forms of unstructured data. Deep learning is recently becoming very good at extracting intelligence out of videos, specifically by detecting objects. Uh, any kind of object that a human, again, can detect under one or two seconds, we can train a model to do it, right? So if you want to count cars, if you want to count uh, vehicles, trucks, bicycles, pedestrians, if you want to understand abnormal behaviors, uh, possible crashes, etc. We can train models to do that. So we're going to see how we're using deep learning with ArcGIS to do that today. And you can think of this use case as bringing in another data source, right? Uh, a real-time data source in addition to the other data sources that would enable richer analysis. And this data source is going to be the intelligence extracted extracted out of videos. Uh, this is a quick example for what's happening and what we're talking about. These are 12. Uh, different uh, video streams coming from uh, 12 cameras and we're using deep learning to count cars and detect cars and track cars uh, and then uh, we want to bring it, this back to the GIS. Uh, this is a simple example uh, but then you can think of any other thing like pedestrians or the type of vehicle or the direction or the acceleration or the speed of the car etc. 
And uh, for the sake of that, we are leveraging a partner um, framework called Metropolis from NVIDIA. So Metropolis is publicly available, it's free, you can download it, and it's an end-to-end -end video analytics framework that helps with the different uh, pieces of work related to processing the video, decoding the video, doing the deep learning and running the inference and encoding the output and passing it through Kafka to the ArcGIS ecosystem. Um, so at the beginning, we were building uh, the initial part from scratch. We were trying out different models, etc. But recently, we have found out that Metropolis has a lot of amazing features that uh, we can just use without reinventing the wheel. And the kind of demos that we're going to show today um, are leveraging this kind of integration. Um, so this is a quick demonstration for using NVIDIA's Metropolis uh, to count cars from different cameras. As you can see here, we have a lot of cameras in the city of Dubuque and uh, the number on each camera reflects the count of cars. You can see the total count on the top left. You can see a time series kind of chart uh, that um, shows the count per time. And you can do different things. You can zoom into each and click on it and see from the size of the camera how many counts. And uh, you can uh, identify anomalies or abnormal behaviors. Uh, so this is a new data stream that uh, might not uh, be possible to had before, but now thanks to deep learning, you can do it. Uh, to have a closer look at what's happening under the hood, this is what's happening really. So this is a feed coming from the CCTV and um, um, uh, NVIDIA's Metropolis comes pre-loaded with pre-trained models. So we don't, in most cases, need to train from scratch. We don't need to do that. We can just use these models and we have models to detect cars, pedestrians, and uh, different types of objects. And you can see that this reflects directly to the operations dashboard uh, by the uh, type of vehicle and the amount uh, of these detections. Uh, this is what you can get if you do this across the whole city. So detecting uh, uh, objects and features from almost 111 cameras, you can see the general patterns, how many cars, how many, how many buses. You can notice what's happening uh, across the city. And then you can do some uh, interesting cool stuff, like detecting anomalies, for example. So these three red dots represent abnormal behaviors. And we can pretty much control how do we want to define an abnormality, right? You can think of it, for example, as comparing the average number of vehicles at intersection uh, or at an area compared to the historical average at this time of the day, at this day of the week. So if the historical average at this time of the day, this day of the week is like 50 vehicles per minute, if this suddenly is uh, much lower than this or much higher, then there might be something wrong, right? That this might be an anomaly. Or we can use machine learning for detecting these anomalies and, and, and find in a more intelligent way what are the abnormal events happening. For example, we have seen some interest from DOTs in understanding what are areas of, uh, that are having possible crashes, right? So uh, to be able to smartly detect these without the need to have humans watching a lot of uh, uh, video feeds. Uh, I want to show you a live demo, actually, with what we're doing in DCDOT. So this is a live dashboard. It's counting the, these different objects. You can zoom in on any of these uh, uh, points to see uh, the kind of counts of detections. You can click on it and uh, see a snapshot for this. Let's do a quick refresh. So if you click on that point here, so it's going to show you a current snapshot. So you can see here that you have different cars, you have a person, you can go and click on another one. So again, think of the possibility that this can unlock if you can automate this overall process real quick. I want to show different kind of scenarios for, for these. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this could be used for multiple scenarios, right? Uh, so these are different use cases if you think about it. Uh, it could be used in an operational setting, more of a real-time kind of operational setting, or more for planning purposes. You can use this concept, for example, to understand infrastructure utilization, how the different roads are used by different kinds of vehicles, and eventually be able to better plan for road infrastructure. You can use it to proactively analyze and deal with congestion. Right? You can quickly understand what are congestion incidents, spot this on the map, proactively deal with this. You can use it to detect abnormal traffic behaviors on the spot, like possible crashes or abnormal events or cars driving in wrong directions. You can use it to optimize uh, traffic signals and adaptively adjust signal controls based on the amount of vehicles and the behavior happening at different segments slash intersections. You can smartly optimize the uh, traffic signals so that 
uh, this could lead to a more optimized traffic flow. And this is a very interesting area we're looking into, and the list goes on. Uh, you can think of extended concepts for that. Like this is an airport powered by our indoor mapping technology and using deep learning to count people in different parts of the airport so that you can understand uh, the different kinds of flow happening in, in the airport. You can even extend it to concepts like this. So uh, uh, this is a very early kind of experiment uh, that uh, NVIDIA is doing, uh, but it's hopefully coming out very soon, measuring social distancing. So by detecting people and where are uh, like their tracks, they can possibly measure the distance between each two, uh, yeah, like the, they can possibly measure the distance between people and understand if this is violating a specific social distancing threshold, like six feet or less, right? Uh, and you can send alerts automatically based on this. And I personally see this as very valuable, right? Because if you think about it, you can apply it in airports or any closed or open areas. Um, you, if you have CCTVs, you can uh, bring in this capability and integrate with RGS to send alerts on the fly. Like for example, receiving alerts like these, like, hey, these are places right now that we are seeing violation for social distancing, kind of minimal threshold and stuff like that. And you can tailor a lot of custom products, information products out of this. Wouldn't that be uh, helpful? Uh, it can help you automatically understand for very wide areas, uh, where are, what are the behaviors of people? How can you adjust, where to deploy more resources, where to enforce more guidelines and stuff like that. Uh, so that's something we are very excited about. So with that said, I want to pass it over to my colleague, uh, David, to start um, showing us the capabilities when it comes to feature extraction from oriented imagery and LiDAR. On to you, David. Thanks, Omar. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into feature extraction from video and oriented imagery using deep learning in RGIS, as Omar has mentioned. So for those of you who attended our previous deep learning webinars, you might have noticed that we deal quite heavily with Nader imagery. And that's fair because Nader is fairly easy to work with. Um, it also has much fewer degrees of freedom than obliques. So you know, with Nader, it's usually from the top-down angle, whereas with obliques, you have uh, basically multiple angles you can view an item at. So in many cases, obliques or oriented imagery also gives us a lot of things that Nader misses out on, things like much higher resolution um, or the capability for real-time capture and so on. And apart from that, many transportation agencies will also generate large amounts of MMS or mobile mapping system data that aren't really being used for an analysis, which is perfect for training a machine learning model over. And by MMS or mobile mapping system, I really mean things like this, where you have car-mounted GPS-enabled cameras that allows you to be able to capture large quantities of imagery at speed. And typically with these type of imagery, you'll also have a lot of metadata associated per image, information such as what is the latitude and longitude at the time of capture, what is the error associated with that lat-long pair, information like what is the bearing of the vehicle, what is the row, pitch, yaw of the camera, and so on. And all of that information is very useful if you want to really geolocate or geotag those features that have been detected. And by features, I mean things like road signs, guardrails, or curbs, basically any kind of asset that might be of importance to various DOTs or transportation agencies. But they can also be things like road cracks, pavement markings, any kind of damage that's been done on the road. And really, to be able to automate this entire collection effort is to support two business use cases. And the first use case is that many DOTs and transportation agencies are interested in creating and maintaining an up-to-date road asset management geodatabase because they want to understand where their features are located on a map as well as what are the properties associated with each feature. And the second use case is more for change detection or damage detection. Obviously, you want to understand if your signs have been knocked over, if your signs are undergoing sign drift, if there's going to be new road cracks appearing on the streets and so on. And all of that is just very suited for machine learning. So when we talk about geotagging features, the general rule of thumb is to always start from photogrammetry because it is going to provide a level of accuracy that other methods won't give you. As long as you have a unique object present in multiple images, it is possible to use photo photogrammetric techniques, so things like epipolar geometry, in order to place those objects very accurately in map space. Um, and at that point, the only real bottleneck to the accuracy of your points is going to be the amount of error that's produced by the recording device. 
So this is an example of if you don't have access to photogrammetry, let's say if your images are collected once every couple of seconds, so you don't have multiple images representing the same unique objects, you can still use machine learning to be able to infer the depth map of those objects. So in this case, we're able to use a model called MonoDepth that ingests the image that you see on the left, and it produces an inference uh, depth map where each pixel essentially corresponds to the distance away from the camera. Here it is again in video format, and you see on the left-hand side, the model is also able to draw out those bounding boxes around objects of interest. So in this case, it is detecting road signs and placing those red bounding boxes around them. So one problem with not using photogrammetry is the issue of having multiple detections. That is to say, if you throw all of your detections on a map without any kind of filtering or post-processing, you'll end up seeing multiple points clustered together when these points really come from the same object. So to get around this problem, we use clustering analysis tools, such as the spatially constrained multivariate clustering tool within Pro. And this allow you to basically combine multiple feature points together based on their physical proximity and their class assignment and so on, uh, essentially letting you know that all of this comes from the same feature. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit into a demo. Uh, I'm going to change my screen here so you should see my operations dashboard. So this is a, a map of a certain highway route in Arizona. And what I've done is run a machine learning model over imagery that's been captured on this highway. And if I click on one of these points, you will see that these signs are being automatically extracted out by the machine learning model. And it's providing a image from which that sign has been extracted including the bounding box and also some uh, some other metadata information such as what is the class that's been picked up, what is the confidence that the machine learning model has assigned to these signs, what is the longitude and latitude pair, and so on. And a good sanity check is to actually filter out these signs by a particular sign class. So in this case, if I click mile marker here, you will see that these signs do indeed seem to be about a mile apart, which is very good to see. And if you click on one of these signs, you will see that, yeah, these have been classified as mile markers. Of course, we can also filter these by signs that have text written in them. So if I click on one of these signs, you will see that this has also been passed over to a optical character recognition network that's able to understand what text is being written out on those signs. So we've also been able to use a machine learning model that trains over 171 unique classes of MUTCD compliant. Uh, sign codes. So this is an example uh, of where you have the ground truth on the right there and what is being detected by the model. And as you can see, the model performs fairly accurately, despite the fact that many of these signs are pretty far away from the camera, or there's multiple signs per image. The model is able to extract those out just fine. So obviously, that's, that was just one class of road assets. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about road cracks and water meters. So these represent a different class of road assets. So for water meters, you might have seen some of the other demos um, that our team has put out previously on how we're able to use machine learning model to detect longitudinal, lateral, and alligator cracks. Well, we've actually been able to refine that model considerably using data from the 2018 IEEE Big Data Cup Challenge. So this is a publicly available data set, and it has now eight classes of road cracks instead of just three. So you have your usual longitudinal road cracks, your construction joint road crack, your lateral crack, a combination of the above, your alligator cracks, uh, road rutting, as well as potholes, and two different types of line fades or line blurs. So you have your crosswalk, uh, crosswalk line blur, as well as the line blur that's happening on the road shoulder there. And to use a machine learning model, we are in fact using the RGS API for Python. And in particular, we are using the single shot detector that's available within the Learn module in the Python API. And this is always a go-to favorite whenever we want to extract out bounding boxes around objects of interest. So in this case, we are simply using prepare data function to essentially perform a bunch of random transformations on top of that uh, training imagery just to increase the amount of data that we have. And as you can see, um, some of those affine transformations include uh, random rotations and so on. And here we are instantiating that single shot detector within notebooks. And we're showing the before training results just to show you that, you know, before training, the model essentially produces random results. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the actual ground truth uh, bounding boxes. 
We're then using the Learning Rate Finder that's part of the RGS API for Python. And if you're interested in learning more about this particular um, functionality, I do recommend you check out a paper called Superconvergence on which uh, the Learning Rate Finder is actually based, or you can check out the official um, documentation as well for the Python API. And to train the model is actually very simple. It's just one line of code you call ssd.fit, and this is going to train automatically, and we can also record the losses. And to show you what the model now performs after training, Again, we see the left-hand column representing the ground truth labels, and now the right-hand side column includes the predictions made by, made by the model, and you see that these conform quite closely to the actual uh, ground truth bounty boxes. Now, one thing that you'll note is that for road cracks in particular, you'll often see that there's multiple bounty boxes kind of crammed together, and one way we can get rid of that is by simply uh, specifying the non-max suppression overlap parameter that basically tells the model, hey, we don't want to have many overlapping bounty boxes. And you see that it gets significantly reduced over here. So of course, we can also uh, use the Python API to infer um, you know, using uh, video inputs as well. And there's actually a, now a functionality built in that allows you to be able to georeference all of those detections. Of course, you need to make sure that the correct EXIF data is, um, is present in your video input. So for water meter detection, this represents a different class of problem because now instead of using bounty boxes, we are using semantic masks, as you see here. Uh, but these are just some of the, uh, the model outputs and you see they perform quite well uh, even though these water meters are very, very tiny, the model is still able to pick out those water meters. And for Iowa DOT, actually, we were interested in understanding driving conditions along different stretches of roads in the winter. So this now is more of a classification task where we needed to assign labels such as dry, wet, uh, partial, or complete snow cover to every single image. And in this case, we were able to come up with a model that performed very well uh, with an F1 score of 0 0.8, which allows us to be able to support various downstream use cases, things like public facing maps and DLT resource routing and so on. So I've talked about oriented imagery. Um, it's obviously a very powerful data type, but there's also LiDAR uh, that's very commonly collected as well. And LiDAR can provide a different set of properties for automated feature digitization. Uh, I'm sure many of you may have seen our prior LiDAR webinar where we talked about you know, building footprint extraction or power line extraction from LiDAR using deep learning. Uh, the difference for this webinar is I want to really focus on terrestrial LiDAR rather than aerial LiDAR. Uh, in terms of data attribution, these two are basically the same. Um, really, the only difference is that terrestrial LiDAR is um, often collected from MMS platforms as well because um, they often come with um, imagery within, uh, with an identical view shed as the point cloud. Uh, because obviously it's very easy to attach a camera to the rig alongside the LiDAR sensor. Uh, so for instance, here we see the 360 degree imagery for the corresponding LiDAR points. Uh, so one cool demo I do want to show is how do we actually perform labeling um, within, within 3D point cloud. So uh, labeling for 2D imagery obviously is very easy within Pro. Uh, but three, for 3D, we also provide that functionality as well. So let's say I have a point cloud right here, and I'm interested in labeling some of these, uh, these points as buildings. So all I would have to do is bring in my last data file. I can click on this layer, and now the classification ribbon tab appears. I can click on this, and I can click on this Create button. So this allows me to create a 2D profile, which can click and create a bounding box right here. I can reposition this to fit nicely over the building. Uh, maybe shrink this down a little bit. And once I'm satisfied, I can click uh, the tick icon. And this is going to bring me to the profile view where I can use the select tool to basically uh, draw a selection over those points that I want to reclassify um, from unclassified uh, to basically building. So once I do that, I can click apply changes and this is going to reclassify those points for me um, automatically. And if I exit out of the profile viewing uh, view over here and allow the map a couple of seconds to refresh, uh, you will see that, in fact, uh, you know, these, these points have been correctly reclassified as buildings, whereas before it was kind of just gray. So that's very neat. And let me go back to the presentation. So assuming you have all of the data points now collected and labeled, what happens after is feature extraction and post-processing, um, which I will talk through using two examples, tree and traffic light uh, extraction. 
So as with um, essentially performing classification or performing detection with aerial LIDAR, um, for terrestrial LIDAR, we also use point CNN to natively classify LIDAR points. Uh, and this is obviously a very good alternative to using um, rasterized LIDAR. So we start from trees. Uh, so now we have a pre-trained model uh, using the tree data set from the Netherlands. Um, and we're basically running that model over data sets that now exist within Los Angeles. And you see some of these examples here. Um, and uh, you can just assess visually that the model performs quite well. Uh, so once we have the raw output from that point CNN model, we need to be able to perform post-processing on those by essentially chaining them together into tasks with an RGS Pro. And this is what the raw output looks like. Uh, we can then run dbscan, which is a clustering, um, uh, clustering type of workflow they can do within Pro that allows you to be able to filter out these yellow points, which are basically noise that are outputted from that model. Of course, you can then construct the minimum bounding geometry and then assign a point to every single centroid. Now, another important uh, thing to be able to extract is the actual heights of the features. So in this case, we're actually using a normalized DSM layer to calculate the height. And here's the finalized result where we see these points hovering over those trees. So everything has now been nicely digitized and, and it's very easy to visualize as well in an information product such as, uh, such as operations dashboard or a web map. Now for traffic lights, um, it uh, represents a class of more challenging objects to automatically extract because of how small they are and how few points constitute a traffic light compared with the context that they are in. Um, however, we do see some very good results that are outputted from the point CNN model. So you can see here, these points actually represent the raw, the raw output of the model. And we can perform the same type of processing within RGS Pro to get rid of the noisy data. So in this case, we are again using dbscan to cluster these points together. And again, we see these yellow points representing noise being isolated, which we can then remove. And of course, we have the finalized feature layer here. Again, we're isolating the noise, removing those noise, and then that leaves you with the finalized features. So this is what that data looks like in the output where we have these hovering points above those objects of interest. So now I would like to hand it over to Omar for some concluding remarks. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, so I'm gonna conclude with some resources and uh, then we're gonna proceed immediately to Q&A. So these are links that I think are gonna be useful for you guys if you want to start doing this kind of work today. Uh, the ArcGIS API for Python can help you access uh, different functionalities in ArcGIS using Python. So it's very helpful for your data scientists. It's very helpful for your GIS people who want to do data science. ArcGIS notebooks, uh, these are links to the product page and sample notebooks can help you get uh, uh, started on these workflows faster because again, it comes pre-configured with uh, a lot of data science packages tightly integrated with ArcGIS. This is a guide to understand how points and end works that can help you with feature extraction from LiDAR. And by the way, we're gonna share these resources on the group today, and we're gonna send it to you guys by email. Uh, this is a link to the road cracks detection notebook that uh, David uh, was showing. And finally, I invite you to go to the GeoAI blog on Medium. It has a lot of use cases and uh, blog posts explaining a lot of these workflows. I wanna close uh, by sharing with you the GUAI LinkedIn group. It's a place where we have a lot of discussions, share resources and events. So uh, uh, I invite you to join this group and collaborate and share any question you might have and, uh, and be up to date with the recent uh, virtual seminars and events and resources that we're gonna share. So with that said, I think we can uh, conclude with the questions. Terry? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Omar, and thanks, David and Daniel. That was uh, really phenomenal. Uh, and I think, as you all can see, just a wide range of uses uh, throughout transportation. And again, we're really just at the early stages uh, to where I think it will really explode. We don't have a tremendous amount of time for questions. There was one. Uh, related to when this webinar would be posted. Um, you'll actually be able to find it on the ESRI transportation webinar page. And so it will be posted in roughly about three or four days uh, and you'll be able to find it there. Um, there was another question really have, going back to the safety analysis um, and it really had to do with pavement markings and, and certainly 
uh, within the safety community, there's a great deal of, of interest in, in understanding uh, the role of pavement markings in safety, and particularly also as we move ahead to connected and autonomous navigation. Uh, those. So uh, can you uh, briefly discuss how uh, you might actually be able to uh, link to uh, pavement markings uh, in the machine learning? Sure. Uh, the answer is simply we try to build the model in whatever deep learning framework and then pass the output somehow to these systems. And usually this integration between uh, ArcGIS and deep learning and other systems can happen through the ArcGIS API for Python. We have a lot of examples for this. Um, so the simple answer is we are working with some partners right now to make this integration happen with the road maintenance kind of solutions. And you can do it today using the ArcGIS API for Python. Okay, um, I think the uh, social distancing uh, <laughs> models uh, attracted a great deal of attention. We have any number of people that uh, asked, one, could you actually walk uh, through the methodology and would you also be uh, able to share those models? So um, let's just say that there will be a follow-on to that uh, and I think it would be a great if, if actually you could just uh, perhaps uh, uh, maybe a way that you could explain to people um, how those models were created. That Again, that created a, a great deal of uh, discussion. Um, and then finally, uh, the tools that you're using, uh, what tools are you using to train your models? And obviously, there are a variety, but could you briefly speak to a couple of the models that you use to, to train your data? Sure, Daniel, do you want to take that one? Um, sure. Um, so depending on the use case, there, there are a lot of options, as was mentioned. Um, the ArcGIS API for Python that David talked about is kind of what I would recommend as your first uh, go-to. So if you go to the, um, the, the documentation that uh, Omar linked to on the ArcGIS API for Python, look at the resources under Learn, um, and that will give you information about the deep learning models that you can run. Um, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we're, we're adding new functionality to that, but there's a little bit more that we want to add. Um, we use PyTorch um, for most of our internal deep learning work um, if it uh, is not accomplishable by the, the Python API. Okay, well, unfortunately, I think that's about all the time that we have today. Obviously, this is a topic and an area of really tremendous interest, and I think we're all going to be spending a lot more time uh, looking at these issues, so this will not be the last uh, webinar that we'll do on this topic for transportation. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, again, these links um, are a great place to start. Uh, Omar and his team are available uh, to help answer questions, uh, to help your organization get going with these, uh, with these uh, technologies. And uh, so again, we wanna thank you for joining today and uh, hope that you'll join us for future webinars. Uh, so again, great. Thank you, Omar, and thank you everyone else for attending. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Have a great day. Thanks.